Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jeff Hauser, head of the Revolving Door Project at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And both the Democratic response to the coming overturning of Roe v. Wade, potential banning of uh, abortion nationwide, certainly half nationwide, Also, what the Biden administration can be doing at this point without any type of legislative pathway. Then we will speak to Jordan Flowers, co-founder of the Amazon Labor Union and the Congress of Essential Workers on the recent win and loss, the Staten Island warehouses, where the Amazon Labor Union goes next. With that said... Christian Smalls, the other co-founder, will be headed to the White House tomorrow, along with Starbucks organizers and other union union organizers from around the country. Don't know the last time that that, something like that happened. Meanwhile, protests around the country in the wake of the country becoming aware that Roe v. Wade is very likely about to be overturned as of June in this year. In Ohio, J.D. Vance, riding on a wave of Peter Thiel money, wins his election in Ohio, will face Tim Ryan, who won his election handily, in the Ohio primary. Nina Turner loses in her second attempt to beat Brown for that congressional seat in Ohio. Meanwhile, people are wondering if the White House Correspondents' Dinner was a super spreader event. Speaking of Starbucks, Union drives, Starbucks plans to increase wages for non-union workers. Huh. That should be illegal, I would think. Well, I guess you can negotiate. It could be could be a tactic, uh, anti-union tactic. I guess we'll find out. Trying to bribe people, basically, honestly. First U.S. Apple store to hold a union election will happen in a month. EU takes steps to ban Russian oil. U.S. job openings hit a record high point, 11.5 in March. The Fed hopes to discipline workers soon. The DHS watchdog says Trump's DHS altered a report on Russian interference in the 2020 election. And sadly, for those of you who have been clutching on to that JPEG of me, the NFT sales market seems to be collapsing. Oh, so all this, sad. Sam, I thought it was here to stay. <laughs> all this and more on today's Majority Report. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. It is, of course, uh, Emma Viglin's favorite day. Hump day, right. Correct. Yes, she coined the phrase, and it is... Um, but uh, I don't know if it's apropos this week because in, in, in many respects, uh, it, it feels like 
this is we're about to enter a period of a very very long slog. Yeah. We're not on the other end of anything. The whole point. week is uphill this week. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I will say that you know. I, I, I'm happy to be doing the show because it's a welcome distraction. I might be staring at the wall. I was at the first Rangers playoff game last night, and it went to three overtimes, uh, and they lost. I was so. I was quite worried, actually. Yeah, Bradley I, was watching on television, and, like, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a difficult <laughs> night emotionally. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry about that, yep. uh, guys. Uh, meanwhile, but it is Hump Day, so. Yeah. Meanwhile, there was uh, protests all around the country. Uh, in the wake of this leak of the Alito brief, a um, lot of speculation, again, still as to uh, where the leak came from, largely irrelevant. Uh, although I do think there's some implications if it ed- ends up coming out that it was, in fact, as some are starting to speculate, that it was one of Alito's clerks that may have leaked this as a way of locking in uh, those five votes. And uh, we will get to that later. But the primary story is, of course, not the fact that we know three months early or four months, uh, three months early that uh, Roe v. Wade is about to be overturned, but that, in fact, it's going to be overturned. There are really three sets of reactions, four sets of reactions. There is the activist reaction There is the Democratic leadership uh, uh, reaction, which uh, thus far has been uh, off base and anemic. I will read a piece uh, of uh, Rebecca Tracer's um, that uh, outlines that. Then there is the reaction by Republicans who want to make this all about the leak. And then there is just simply a downplaying uh, by Republicans of what this actually means, because they know this is an incredibly unpopular and frankly undemocratic and we'll talk more about that um uh change to the basic rights of uh, essentially half of our population in this country and they want to pretend like it means nothing here is joe biden's response have your irreparably changed the court do you think that this leak has irreparably changed the court we've never seen this happen before well you know if if this decision holds, it's really quite a radical decision. Um, and again, the underlying premise, and again, I've not had a chance to thoroughly go into the report, the, the, the decision. But it basically says all the decisions relating to your private life, who you marry, whether or not you decide to conceive a child or not, whether or not you can have an abortion, a range of other decisions, whether or not how you raise your child. What does this do, uh, and does this mean that in Florida they can decide they're going to pass a law saying that same-sex marriage is not permissible, it's against the law in Florida? Uh, so there's a whole, it's, it's a fundamental shift in American jurisprudence. Now, um, at one point yesterday, Joe Biden did say the word abortion. We, don't, we didn't hear it from Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Because this generation of Democratic politicians have grown up with the idea that we need to treat it as icky. It needs to be the icky. Because if we don't, if we don't concede the moral problems with an abortion in some way, as opposed to it being a medical procedure that a woman chooses so that they can have control of their destiny. We don't, if we don't like concede the moral problems with it, we're going to seem like out of touch, even though the vast majority of Americans believe that women should have the right to an abortion. Here is Mitch McConnell taking one of the two Republican tacks. One of them is to simply say, this is not going to mean anything. We'll play some of those uh, later. Here is uh, McConnell's. And we'll, as far as I'm concerned, if we're in the majority, remain the case in perpetuity. We spent decades trying to remake the court, overturn Roe. You're possibly single-handedly responsible for the 6-3 majority. So do you take personal credit for abortion rights likely to go away for millions of people in this country? Yeah, I think the story today 
is an effort by someone on the inside to discredit the institution of the Senate, uh -huh. which continues a pattern that we've observed over the last couple of years. Leader Schumer over on the steps of the uh, Supreme Court calling out justices by name. Sheldon Whitehouse and others filing amicus briefs threatening the court. Uh, efforts to pack the court. Efforts to have term limits for court justices. What's unique about today is this is the first time we've had somebody on the inside try to attack the institution. Uh, fortunately, I think the Chief Justice has taken that seriously and we'll find the leaker. What about Leader McConnell, Leader McConnell, Democrats, Democrats say that the prospect of Roe being overturned and some of the more restrictive trigger laws coming into effect without exemptions for rape and incest will shock the public and motivate voters in November. What is your response to that? How does this change the midterms? Well, that's not the story for today. The story for the day is what I just said. Leader McConnell. Leader McConnell. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, the story today. And, you know, we, we can talk, we, we'll talk more in the fun half about this question as to um, uh, the potential identity of the leaker and the implications of the identity of the leaker uh, and the implications of the leak in and of itself. But uh, the bottom line is, if you listen to any of the Republicans, and, 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 it's, and, it, and it is the case even hearing uh, reports from people who live in some of the most conservative parts of the country, the Republican lawmakers are not talking about this because they know, they know this is, uh, has the potential, has the potential to um, unleash an incredible amount of, of anger and energy on the political process because we are talking about the denial after 50 years, 50 years of a woman's right to choose in this country, make no mistake about it, if we're not there in every 50 states now, it is just a matter of time. Just as this moment was inevitable, when you elect a Republican president, when the Republicans have shown that they're willing to keep one of those seats open, and just a reminder, you know, you hear anybody talk about uh, the idea that abortion is a question that should be uh, determined by democracy. Understand that in many of the states that you're talking about democracy, you have people voting for Democrats in the state legislature over 50 percent and being represented by only 30 or 40 percent in the state legislature. When you talk about democracy, you should know that Donald Trump did not win the most amount of votes. An electoral college is not a democratic small d institution. You had him appoint three of the justices, one of whom the seat was open because the Senate represented the 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 power in the Senate during the Obama years represented by less than half of the country because the Senate is also one of our least democratic institutions decided to keep that seat open. So democracy plays no role in this. Democracy plays no role in this. Democracy will not have an opportunity to address this either because of the way the Senate is configured the way that the presidency and the Supreme Court is configured, and in large extent, the way that uh, gerrymandering has taken place. And the Supreme Court is there, in theory, to protect rights from the whims of, say, if Florida wants to, as Biden put it, uh, ban gay marriage. They're supposed to institute broad rights for Americans and say that uh, this is the law of the land. Americans should, women have the right to an abortion. You have the right to marry whoever you want. You have the right to participate in sodomy, as Lawrence v. Texas said. You, you, the, being gay is not outlawed. Uh, and and, and we, if the language in this ruling stands, and even if it is just like a concurring opinion or something like that, because we see how Alito's 
stealing from Clarence Thomas's descents. Um, they're, they're given the roadmap to roll back all those things. Yep. All right, we'll talk to uh, Jeff Hauser in a moment, who I'm sure has some thoughts on this as well. Uh, first, a word from our sponsor. One of the benefits of ExpressVPN is not just the security you get when you use the internet. It's also, in far, uh, as far as entertainment, uh, is uh, also a huge boon. Watching Netflix without using ExpressVPN is like going to a casino and only being able to play on the slot machines. Hmm. Why limit yourself? The big money is somewhere else, as you know. You know oh, not yeah. necessarily for me when we talk about a casino. But Netflix, and people don't necessarily realize this, they have different content libraries for every, every country. Thousands of different shows, but without a VPN, you only get access to what's available in your location. So, for instance, I want to watch The Joker. I don't want to buy it. You Did you know watch that the Joker? Yeah. Oh, the movie. Uh, okay. I what? just was surprised. Well, I've, oh no, I saw it once here, but then it, I then I don't want to buy it or I don't rent it. No, I, I finally it saw it actually recently. It's not bad. No, I think it's pretty good. I just uh, said, the, yeah. It's in uh, I, now, as you know, I live in the United States, but it's only available on Netflix in Australia. Ah. So bingo, bango. I uh, get on. I hit my uh, uh, VPN. Uh, 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 app i fire up my tv i get on netflix and now after i refresh i can watch it in australia uh the office you want to watch the u.s office maybe i'm not gonna watch it on peacock um because <laughs> i'm not gonna pay for that uh but it's playing in canada in netflix Whoa. so bingo bango there you go uh, I thought Bingo Bango was an Australian reference. But it was for Canada. <laughs> no, Bingo Bango works also for Canada. Um, and the Ali G show. Oh, no way. UK. It's on Netflix UK. It's not on uh, Netflix US. Bingo Bango. VPN. Express VPN. It gives you blazing fast speeds. You can, you can stream in HD, no problem. It's compatible with all your devices, phones, laptops, media consoles, smart TVs, whatever you got. It's got servers in 94 different countries. You can gain access to uh, thousands of new shows. You like anime? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, well, I don't. But I, I mean, yeah, I others know. do. Yep. Be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services. When you can get things like BBC, iPlayer, YouTube, more, all, you can use all of them internationally. Nice. Stop paying full price for streaming services and getting access only to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash majority. Don't forget to use my link at expressvpn.com slash majority to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. And just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. You join the... Uh, uh, Majority Report at jointhemajorityreport.com. You not only get the free show free of commercials, but you get uh, the fun half as well. And uh, all right, I uh, want to welcome back to the program Jeff Hauser. He is the head of the Revolving Door Project at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, Jeff, welcome back. I'm here with Emma Viglin. Uh, great to be here with you guys. Yes, of course. So uh, let me just get, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, we had talked about having you come on. We'll talk about the, the Biden, you know, w w what we can do with the Biden agenda. But I know you have a lot of thoughts both about um, the Supreme Court. You were former uh, DOJ uh, uh, back in the day, back in George W. Bush's day. Um, and um, I know that you also have some very uh, uh, strong opinions about the Democratic leadership and the way that they, um, they address these type of things. Um, so let's talk about that. I, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time speculating about the leak, but what about the implications of the leak? What do you think is, what, what difference does it make that we know about th this draft brief now um, as opposed to, well, I, I, I'm not knowing about it now well i think that the impact of the leak is to potentially slightly erode the uh erosion of supreme court integrity and the view of the supreme court by the american people uh this 
decision, which I suspect will be the same in a month and a half, now exist in a strange uh, mathematical state of very likely but not quite certain. And so there is no longer going to be novelty if and when, I think it's a matter of when, the Supreme Court ends Roe v. Wade. Uh, but the certainty will not come at the same time as the novelty, which is what normally happens with a Supreme Court opinion. And so I think to some extent, the reason why I suspect this leak came from the majority was to minimize the degree of backlash against the Supreme Court. However, we all can frustrate that plan by sustaining our anger at the Supreme Court and not just making it a 24, 72 hour news cycle, but making it one of the key motivators for uh, center, center left and progressive organizing for the years to come. The Supreme Court has been a rogue institution for multiple decades. As you alluded to, I worked at the Department of Justice under George W. Bush. The reason I was working under George W. Bush was I thought Al Gore would not only win the election, but would be inaugurated. And then Bush v. Gore and a lot of other shenanigans in the state of Florida occurred. And it ended up that George W. Bush was president. And I got stuck doing two years and two days under John Ashcroft, which is a long story for another day. But the basic point is Bush v. Gore should have taught the American people that the Supreme Court is a low integrity institution. However, I think the right has just been constantly angry at the Supreme Court, going back to school prayer and Brown v. Board of Education and continuing about Roe v. Wade. And I think it's going to take this reversal of Roe v. Wade to really shake up American politics and make center, center left and progressive people the main people angry at the Supreme Court. And I think if we all get appropriately angry at the Supreme Court, that uh, opens up the opportunity for real change in the next decade. Jeff, um, uh, let me just do this for you for one moment. Uh, Only God, no other king. Let the mighty eagles so That was uh, your former uh, a boss, uh, John Ashcroft. And uh, it's very rare that I have the opportunity to play that and people understand what's going on there. So I just wanted to do that singing? for your bit. Yes, singing? that was John Ashcroft singing uh, Let the Mighty Eagle Soar. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, you also I've used been... to have prayer lunches with staff at the Department of Justice or prayer breakfast, excuse me. Um, if I remember with... correctly, he also put um, a sheets on some statues that were uh, bearing the bust of a woman. Is that right? Yes, or? there were like Greek or Roman statues at the main justice building that had bare breasts, and that was considered far too provocative by Attorney General Ashcroft. I, I just want to make this point, and 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 we're going to get into this later. But uh, Rebecca Tracer has uh, written a, a wonderful piece about this, where the response from the Democratic leadership has been, "This is a function of the Trump, uh, you know, Republicans," and I think that like. As you're talking about 20 years ago, this, the, the chief uh, uh, law enforcement officer of the country um, was covering up the busts of Greek statues. This is not a function of Donald Trump. This is a function of a 50-year program by the Republican Party in the conservative movement. I saw just a headline of Brett Stevens writing in the New York Times today. This is not conservative. This is radical. This is the sine qua non of the conservative movement, the, the everything that is in, embodied in the suppression and oppression of women's rights is um, an extension of their entire uh, political project. Yeah, in the post-World War II era, the economic conservatives, the plutocrats in America made a series of alliances with uh, far right, Christian theocrats, which obviously is not meant to paint a broad brush of Christians, but of people who are, in fact, not just Christian, but theocrats, obviously a minority. And they've made uh, an alliance. It's been ever deepening alliance. And this is the fruition of it, just as much as another potentially cataclysmic Supreme Court case um, involving the rights of the Environmental Protection Agency that could come down in the next four to six weeks from the Supreme Court. Uh, I think this term of the Supreme Court is going to 
underscore why this unholy alliance emerged between theocrats and plutocrats. And the rest of us are going to have to organize like heck to get out from under them. And we should say that EPA ruling is going to deal with possibly an assault on the Chevron doctrine or an uh, you know, imposing of the non-delegation uh, principle, which would effectively prevent our government from protecting us from polluters, poisoners. I mean, I mean, a whole. I mean, it, it, it could essentially kneecap the ability of the government to to serve uh, the people, and uh, you know, against the interests. Of, of corporations and, and, and capitalists who want to privatize uh, their profits and socialize their costs, which means that, that that's on us. Um, all right, let's just pivot a little bit to, uh, y y y let's talk something specifically about the Revolving Door Project, just because we, we have a, a co-founder of the Amazon Labor Union coming on after you. Um, and uh, the, there are union organizers headed to the White House tomorrow I would say the two areas and, and, you know, get your assessment of this, where the Biden administration is doing pretty well, particularly in terms of personnel, is uh, at the National Labor Relations Board and, and sort of these union issues and uh, on antitrust and the Federal Trade Commission. But there is a problem with the Democratic leadership. I think that is in um, that is uh, exemplified by the fact of the involvement of the global strategy group. Will, will you talk about that? I mean, we talk about the revolving door project, right? I mean, this is, the, on one end of that revolving door is the global strategy group, I would imagine. Yes, uh, the global strategy group is one of the most important uh, consulting firms that is associated with the Democratic Party and center left institutions. It hires among the best regarded pollsters and other political operative types. And they earn their uh, reputations by doing uh, campaign work. Uh, but the way they really earn their big money is that in between the peaks of election seasons, their stable client base becomes increasingly corporate. And Global Strategies Group has been one of the most conspicuous in taking on uh, corporations whose actions are most at odds with the agenda of the Democratic Party. And that includes that the Global Strategy Group has been working, advising Amazon on how to try to fight the union at Amazon, the Amazon Labor Union. And obviously, they were unsuccessful in Staten Island, thank God. But it is institutions like Global Strategy Group giving insight to corporations into how to influence Democratic politicians that it's just in invaluable, especially in blue cities like a place like New York City, blue states like New York State, um, and even within the Democratic administration because Joe Biden relied on Global Strategy Group for a lot of his polling. Um, and I don't know that the effects are directly in the case of lobbying. There definitely can be lobbying. But I think what's more pernicious and widespread is just an understanding, detailed understanding of who uh, are the people who have the levers of power in a Democratic administration giving strategy on how to influence them. And then on the other hand, telling your clients to not, bu uh, not fight against uh, your clients without necessarily disclosing the conflict of interest. So if you wonder why do democratic politicians not talk about enforcing laws that are being broken by corporations, uh, we've done polling with data for progress on this. It is incredibly uh, popular across all political categories, Democratic, Republican, or non-aligned, uh, for the government to crack down on corporate criminality. Uh, everyone knows corporate criminality is rife. They know it's a problem, and no one really will stick up for them. The polling numbers are off the charts. And if you're trying to think about why does the government not do anything about it, well, it could definitely hurt the odds of the government saying, hey, maybe we should crack down on corporate scoff laws that might improve our polling. If your pollster doesn't bring that up as an option, if the corporate pollster doesn't poll, what will it be like if Joe Biden picks a fight directly with Jeff Bezos? So while it's very good and it, it is a break with recent American political history that Joe Biden is going to be meeting with these organizers, and I applaud Biden and Walsh and others for bringing about that meeting, I also want to see this be not just about supporting workers, 
but fighting against plutocrats who are trying to break unions. Howard Schultz at Starbucks, it just came clear, is openly violating labor law and saying that he's going to pay unionized workplaces less money than non-unionized workplaces. That just broke this morning. Like, we need Joe Biden to fly out to Seattle and stand outside uh, Howard Schultz's home and pick a fight with him. We need to see Democrats battling on behalf of working people. And I don't think that that is likely if their pollster is being paid by the plutocrat. So Democrats should use pollsters and operatives who are focused solely on the Democratic Party and progressive ends rather than dipping their toes the very into the very rich water of corporate work. And, and how many people working at the White House or in the staffs of the Senate, uh, Democratic Senate offices or congressional offices, how many of them uh, anticipate sending their resume to Global Strategy Group um, at one point in the next, I don't know, six to uh, 48 months? I mean, this is where they're coming from, right? I mean, this is the problem, is that we had this with the Obama administration, that the, all of the top figures in the Obama administration go into these gig economy jobs, and then all of a sudden, like, the idea of, like, holding Uber to account for the way that it treats workers is just, like, off the table. There's no one there to, to do this. Yeah, I mean, we at Revolving Door Project have been particularly focusing on Anita Dunn, who is about to begin her third distinct stint in the Biden White House. I mean, you might say, isn't the Biden White House only barely more than a year old? And yet uh, she's gonna begin her third distinct stint. Uh, she is one of the name founding partners at SKDK, uh, Knickerbocker, which is one of the largest democratic consulting firms. Um, I think a firm that actually often collaborates with Global Strategies Group. Um, and her protégés have been moving in and out of the administration as well. Uh, a little bit younger, a little less senior, but still quite influential figures. This has become the expectation that if you succeed in politics, that you cannot survive on a nonprofit salary or the nonprofit equivalent, that you need to be making serious coin. And the way you make serious coin, you can't do that just working on democratic politics. And so long as we have people who are in democratic politics so that they can make a half a million dollars a year or more eventually, you're just not gonna see the Democratic Party be as populist as it can and should be. And, and so to be clear, when you say third distinct um, uh, service at the White House by Dunn, she's like in for two months, back at work for two months, at, back at work, back at uh, SD Knickerbocker, and then back, and then back, like, are they is, is, like, have you incorporated her into your logo for the revolving door project? No, but we've spent a lot of time uh, hammering down to make sure we understand all the different implications. So she was hired as what's called a special government employee at the beginning of the Biden administration, which means that she was hired with an expectation that she would work fewer than 130 days. Uh, as we predicted to people before 130 days was up, she spent rather more time there. Uh, she hit around I don't know, 225 days roughly. But by working as a special government employee, uh, she had fewer revolving door limitations on her work. She also artificially suppressed her salary, which we also predicted and was wor worked with the Washington Post on this before the uh, salary data came out on the Biden White House. So she took a salary a couple thousand dollars less than what would have required her to make her past clients at SKDK public. Uh, it was totally manipulative. She then returned for a week in March of this year. And now it's been reported that she is coming back. I don't know if she is literally in the building yet as of today, but that she's gonna be coming back at some point, I believe in the month of May, uh, to work on beginning to prepare uh, the administration for uh, Republican subpoenas and the like. And I don't know if she's going to be hired as a full-time employee or not, but we have urged uh, the uh, administration to uh, compel her to sign ethics uh, agreements that would treat her just the same as any 
figure of comparable seniority and not allow her to play these sort of games to do an end run around the ethical obligations of senior White House staff. Sh shouldn't be a function of the dollar amount. I mean, that's like the that's like, you know, I don't know, Rush Limbaugh taking out nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars so he could go uh, buy his uh, his um, his Oxycontin, I think, at the time and not have it. Uh, the bank trigger the right. uh, the the reporting requirements. All right. Well, so, OK. Let's just pivot to the idea, and we just have a couple minutes left here, um, and, and, and we really should have you back to talk more about these things. But um, what at this point, now that uh, Joe Biden's uh, legislative agenda is dead, um, we all know, I think, that uh, Biden has the legal authority, although we, the memo outlining this has been completely redacted because of, I guess, it's top secret, um, uh, to... Uh, forgive um, student debt. And that seems to be uh, being deliberated at the White House. They're just deciding how much can we shoot ourselves in the foot by making this means tested so that it uh, steps on our own message and, and gives us no political value in doing it. Uh, but what else can, can the Biden administration do at this point, both from a, you know, an important policies perspective, but also for a, a you know, in a, in, a, in a political sense, like, you know, th something has to happen between now and in and, and, and the fall unless the, the Democrats want to get slaughtered. Yeah, I mean, we are thinking about supply chain and inflation issues as a paradigmatic example where the executive branch needs to both substantively put as, <clears throat> as much pressure on corporate America as possible and politically to be seen as fighting for consumers against corporate price gouging. The shipping industry, that is like the people, the consortiums that move boats around the world, uh, they made more profits in 2021 than they had by far in the decade previously. Massive windfall profits. And they've been making no obvious investments to increase supply so that goods could move more freely and more cheaply. And they say, well, it's ephemeral, so why would we invest? Uh, and then anti-monopoly people said, well, why would we allow the nine main shipping companies in the world to form into three consortiums and allow them access to pricing information so that they can bid rig together? And there's never been a good answer on that. Well, it, the new estimates I've read this morning in Bloomberg suggest that from $200 billion of international shipping profits in 2021, it's gonna be 300 billion in 2022, and they expect it to exceed $100 billion a year for the foreseeable future. We need the Federal Maritime Commission to do something about this. Uh, we need the Department of Transportation, which does not include the Federal Maritime Commission for international shipping, but has jurisdiction over domestic boats, that is boats between uh, American ports, as well as considerable aspects of our rail and trucking system. We need Pete Buttigieg to do his job, which is not to be seen having lunch with people, but is to make the transportation system in this country work. We need the Agriculture Department to go after price gouging by meat packers and other industries. We need to see the uh, health and human services go after uh, big pharma. There are all sorts of ways to go after drug prices. We need substantive fights on these matters, and we also need to be caught publicly fighting. You're not necessarily going to get results between now and November on all of these fronts, but you can be seen fighting, and that's what the administration needs to be doing. They need to fight corporate greed on behalf of the ordinary American. And, and frankly, um, you know, it, it, unless our government does these things, um, it's going to be harder to tell that the Supreme Court has taken away our, the ability of our government to do these things. Um, uh, you know, the, the, if, they're, if, if they're inert as it is now, um, uh, inactive rather, um, the, we're not going to see the loss of what the government could do. FDR tried stuff with an adverse Supreme Court for the first five years of his administration. And he was unafraid to lose at the Supreme Court and then weigh in against the Supreme Court. The Biden administration needs to try to do the right thing. And they're going to run into obstacles. Joe Manchin's an obstacle, and so is Sam Alito. We can't pretend otherwise. That doesn't mean he's going to succeed in all regards, but he has to try because you're not going to win any fight that you fail to begin. 
And you're not going to the way you can win by losing if you are seen fighting for the right people and against the right villains. Jeff Hauser, head of the Revolving Door Project at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Uh, I read the stuff that you guys put out all the time. I really appreciate you coming on um, and uh, we'll have you back on again soon. It's my great pleasure. All right. Um, let's bring in uh, Jordan Flowers. He is the. Oh, we need to take a quick break. All right, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Jordan Flowers, the co-founder of the Amazon Labor Union, the Congress of Essential Workers. We are back, Sam Cedar, Emma Vigeland on the Majority Report. I want to welcome to the show Jordan Flowers. He is the co-founder of the Amazon Labor Union and the Congress of Essential Workers. Uh, Jordan, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So, um, so far on Staten Island, uh, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, won the first election uh, in the, the first warehouse. Uh, lost the second one uh, just, uh, I guess it was Monday, uh, the LDJ... Um, uh, uh, LDJ5. LGD5. Okay. So, all right, let's just lay out for us, uh, and, and then we'll get, we'll, we'll sort of go backwards on this, but what what was different 
um, with the first organizing effort and the second organizing effort to get a sense of like, you know, why a vote in one part of a Staten Island warehouse would work as opposed to another one? Uh, so our core team at, of AOU workers are mainly from JFK8. We, we have about five or six core workers of LDJ5. Uh, they actually, so Amazon, Tennessee, they had union busting. And they sent them over to LDJ quicker than uh, JFK because we won that facility first. So they already were examining our, our, our work and they were expressing the fact that, again, we're not a, a great union, not, we're not an official union. But again, we had our first victory April 1st, 2022. Uh, you know, it's just the union busting tactics that they, they, they had, uh, ex- what is it, expressed to the, the workers in LDJ5, especially that they're part time, that it was easy to get to them. Because they work short as shit. And there's a higher percentage of part-time workers at uh, the 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 second again um, uh, LD LDJ five LDJ five than there are than there are JFK right? I mean, uh, correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's that a, yeah. So that Sorry. played into their hands a little bit, right? Well, well, give us a sense. I'm curious as to like you know what it is uh, when you're approaching uh, part-time workers. What what is their perspective? How is that different than I mean, you know, may, maybe it's somewhat obvious, but I but I don't think it necessarily is. Uh, but but what, what what did you find when you were engaging these folks? So uh, again, uh, LDJ focus part time. They only work four hours. They work only four hour shifts. JFK they work ten to twelve hour shifts. So they're they're less they're less on their feet, and they, most most of the time they're only in and out. So again, they they're on a quicker they're on a quicker schedule than JFK where we stay longer. So again, the moment uh, these workers coming into LDJ five, union buses are already on it, and again, it's right in and out. It's an in and out process for them. And oh, so, again, we, yeah. So you don't have the same opportunity to talk to them because uh, they're on premises uh, so little. Did, do they also have a different perspective towards their jobs? Insofar as like, this is just a short time thing for me, and I don't want to rock the boat and just get in and out. Uh, no. So. Uh, it's just, it's again, so this, they still do some of the same labor as JFK, but it's just in a smaller amount of time because it's a sort center. So we're really just sorting more items instead of JFK where we're packing and sep- uh, shipping out. So, uh, again, it's easier to talk to workers that are only working there for four hours okay. because they're not really experiencing the work they're really experiencing in JFK. So it's, it's still two different settings. It's still the same company. It's just that since they work shorter time, they, they don't have that much issue. But it's easier to, again, to get someone that only works a four-hour shift than uh, express to someone that works a 10 to 12-hour shift. Okay. And so um, what do you guys, what, what, what next? Now, I know um, that um, uh, some of you are heading to the White House tomorrow. What is the relevance of that for the ALU? Um, we actually had not there today. I was going to be there myself, but I ended up staying home. So... Uh, no, the importance of that is, again, this is a, work, a workers' led union. So this is tier one to tier three, Chris Bowles and the management. Uh, this, this shows workers' powers that came together and, you know, wanted to see a change in their facility. And, you know, be, being that uh, it really started out with TCOEW, the Congress of Essential Workers, which was four of us. And then we had Brett, uh, Brett Daniels, Connor Spence, and Jason Anthony, and uh, Christian Martinez, then joined on later on, that, uh, you know, again, these, these workers we know on a daily basis. And we, we've been there since opening day. We experienced the 60 hour shifts, the double mandatory overtime that, um, you know, it was, it was as well aware that these workers, so it's been open for six years. These, these workers are well known that, you know, it's a really it's a safe facility and that it needed to be a change. So again, uh, coming with ALU, we, we formed it as a workers led and, you know, successfully got the union this year, April 1st, 2022. And so, um, what, and what, what's the value, though? I mean, to you guys, uh, to 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 have like um, the the White House sort of like recognize what you're doing. Does it have any value? Um, uh, and- it, has, it has extreme value. Again, you know, we're dealing with a, a almost a trillion dollar company, and they're still not even trying to acknowledge us. But again, the White House is, 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 is a major thing that, uh, you know, seeing that work is coming together again. To, to make a change for their facility and to see the president, the vice president, see, see a change that, you know, again, it's for the people. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really, uh, I could say, how can I put it? Uh, very, it's a, it's a very great moment. I should just put it as it's a, it's a really great moment, especially that it's the White House. So for us, for us to be invited 
and you know to, to to see all this and show that again regular workers could make a change in their facility and that you know everyone's watching could you have ever imagined that this would be the outcome like when you guys first started organizing and of, of course i'm sure you hope for the best but the fact that it's been this massive story and it's been seen as this huge victory in a sea of other labor and organizing efforts um could could you have ever foreseen i don't know getting invited to the white house for example um i mean i would i would say no for one because again it's it's still it's we're still the fact that we're still we're still building the alu and we're still you know fighting for workers right now so i mean again for, for the white house to invite us that that shows you how big we are and that shows you how uh how successful and how much of a fight we're putting up at Amazon. And to be recognized by the White House is it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I want to talk about going forward, but I want to go back a little bit too. I mean, when you mm -hmm. when you, you, you uh, got together and you set up the Congress of Essential Workers, obviously this was taking place with the backdrop of COVID. Um, right. Because prior to that, we didn't recognize that there were any essential workers. And it was really, it was a way of saying like, we're willing to let you get COVID uh, and be on the front line of getting COVID uh, so that we can stay home and have our packages delivered or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, will, will you talk about, like, what was your perspective towards unions prior to the time that you, you started, wh whatever the, the initial conversations where you have, where you were like, we need protections. Like, I'm curious as to what that journey looked like and how you came to say, like, we can set up our own union. So actually, I've had two. I have two incidents with Amazon when they fired me. So for anyone who doesn't know, I have lupus nephritis, which is an immunocompromised illness. Both my kidneys failed. I'm 23. Uh, I actually started at Amazon at the age of 19. So back in 2018, yeah, I was 19. Uh, that was my first full-time job. Uh, Again, uh, the union, the union question, uh, I've been part of a union because of my mom. She's a registered nurse, so she had 11.99. So I would get in the perks of a union. This is my first actual ever union working with, so I'm still growing and learning. But uh, otherwise, Gerald Bryson told me more about unions, and he get, went into more depth because Amazon fired me due to my medical issue. The first time, and it wasn't a proper leave, so they ended up terminating me. I had to fight for my job back, and I ended up getting it back. And then again, uh, when COVID came around, before TCOEW, before ALU, uh, Amazon was already fighting with me because of my health issues. They, May 1st, 20, 2020, they decided all oh, Amazon workers should come back to work. And in my case, I can't because Amazon workers are tested in positive at hundreds, hundreds of rates. That's almost a day-to-day. -day. And we're talking about thousands of workers in this facility walking in and out. So they're not even catching up with numbers on COVID. So I wasn't going to risk my life to be in the facility, and uh, I'm my mom's only son. And being that I have a mental compromise, I could be in a ventilator in a hospital, I could be anywhere sick as a dog, and I don't want that for myself. And again, so Amazon fired me June 15th, 2020. I also think that was due to organizing and rallying and protesting. Uh, they, they, I think that they didn't care about my medical issues. So now again, Amazon has workers with disabilities. They're not being, they're not being accommodated right now as we speak that, you know, these workers are testing positive, being sick, and they're not being taken real care of. Uh, one worker, her name is Kushan Brown. She was a single mom with a 13-year-old daughter. She ended up passing away. She was testing workers inside her facility. And, you know, they only opened her door to six weeks of counseling. This is a girl who's not going to see her mom ever again. She's only 13, you know. So she only has her, her aunt and her grandmother. And, you know, it, it's, it's sad to hear that these workers are not being cared of. And especially when you have a medical issue, that, that shows that this company only puts profit over people. And I took that stance where I wasn't going to risk my life to go back to work and, uh, you know, catch COVID. Did you find in the course of, of, of organizing in both uh, warehouses that people who had some peripheral experience like you did uh, with a union, your, your mom's union, were more open to the idea of a union? I mean, I, I, I guess what I'm asking on some level is like, is there value in just educating people as to what unions are and do, even if they don't need it at the moment, because ultimately at one point they, they, they may be in a situation where somebody comes up and says, we're organizing it. And, it, and if it makes people more open and, and, and ease, more easily organized into a union. 
Um, yeah, I mean, you seen how fast they were getting union buses in these facilities. So again, uh, it it was it was communicating with workers. Again, a lot of these workers are my age and a little higher, and they don't know what union is. And even if they do, they 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 think it's a bunch of other things that goes on behind the scenes. But again, a union is a, a group of workers that came together to help protect their uh protect their workers. Again, being what worker led, we we understand what's going on in the Amazon facility, and we already demanded these changes. So uh, it was it was more so educating the workers that uh you know we're here to protect them instead of that they're hearing about union dues that Amazon is slandering them about that they even told workers that they had to pay a hundred dollar union fee that's never been heard of so you know these are little tactics that Amazon was doing but again it was more so that they're brainwashing these workers to just say no just say no just say no and don't listen to them instead of workers reaching out which is again where we would come in and stand out for the workers which we, we have been doing, serving them food, giving t-shirts, so, you know, just communicating with these workers again. Because again, me, Chris, Derek, and Gerald haven't been in the facility in almost, well, me, Chris, and Jerry haven't been in the facility in three years, my fault, Derek still works. Uh, that, again, these are all new workers that Amazon's firing and hiring, so it's another process that, as we're talking to some of these workers, Amazon's gonna be firing them the next day. So it, it, it shows that, um, that you know, we're, 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 we're standing at, uh, with the union, that we're, we are organizing the fellow workers that we are here to protect and not just here to take money. But again, it's uh, it's protecting that as fast as Amazon is telling them to vote no and all these bad lies about us, is, is the same way we're trying to act quickly tell them that we're not even, that's not even us. So um, obviously, I, you're probably not um, interested in telling me the next location you're going to try and organize because that's when uh, Amazon sends all their consultants there and start their job. But but in a more general sense, like what do you guys um, like? Do you have now a sort of new set of tactics and strategy that you have like developed over the course of, of both winning and losing an election and an idea of like, the the profile of the place that you want to uh, organize and is that like are we just talking you know Staten Island or are we talking New York State or are we talking uh, well, the rest of the country? Well, I mean, I could I could put it as that every state's uh, union laws could be different. So I mean, being that we did New York New York City, I mean, it's possible we are going upstate to help them out too because again, they're still part of New York City, so they would have to still have the same union. So New York, yeah, we're going to continue expanding until we further anywhere else. All right, sounds good. And are there? I mean, are, are has there been like? Do you guys sit around and say like, you know what? Next time, this is what we need to do differently. Um, I mean, I, I imagine that you're, you know, you're learning as you go. Uh, yeah, again, it's a learning experience with workers led. So we're just finding ways to more ways to connect with workers. Again, uh, we have barbecues. We give out t-shirts, keychains that. Uh, you know, we even we even uh, we're about to start uh, our organizing classes, like uh, if they need help inside. So uh, again, it's it's um we are we are, we are uh, going to start training workers now because again, the bigger the crowd, more pressure Amazon would have on them. Is there uh, is there a website or some place where our viewers can come can support you guys? Uh, yeah, so it's AmazonLaborUnion.org. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Amazon, Amazon Labor Union. Uh, we have uh, TikTok. We have Facebook. Uh, you know, follow Chris Smalls, myself, Gerald, Derek, uh, Angie. There's, there's a bunch. Uh, but mainly ALU, uh, Amazon Labor Union on Twitter and TikTok. All right. So let me ask you this. I mean, I assume if there's if there's some workers out there in a in a Amazon uh, um, warehouse or facility anywhere in the country you guys would encourage them if they have questions about how to organize with you or on their own to contact. But what, what would you also say to someone who's working in, I don't know, just some other type of a facility and they like, are, are there, is there some advice that you have uh, for them? Are you, are you guys open to saying like, okay, you're not part of Amazon. Maybe uh, you're in a different sector than we are. It's not necessarily something that we're, we're, we're ready to, to you know, formally get involved with, but you know, here's some advice. Uh, are you guys open to that type of thing as well? So again, that would be the Congress of Essential Workers. We use that as the Amazon speaking voice, but we're going to continue on to speak to every other facility, any other store that needs help. That uh, you know, we'll give them the layout. And again, TCOEW is consistent for the walkout that it don't 
has to be four. It could be a group of ten. It could be whoever and whoever's working that day, whoever you with. Uh, again, if you all want to make a change and make that decision, be that y'all a solid team now, and y'all should you know coordinate with each other and make sure that uh, everyone's on the same page. That uh, again, you know, you're you're taking on companies, not just Amazon. You know, we had Starbucks with this one in the that you know these workers came together and walked out, and they 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 closed and made a change. So it doesn't have to be a big group. It could be yourself. It could be a small group. It could be your friends. That uh, you know, as long as you put your mind to it and you stick to it, it's gonna be a lot of hard work to thin, a lot of long days and long nights. But you know, if you have if you have a lot of self investment in yourself, then you can get the work done. Well, uh, Jordan Flowers, um, uh, really appreciate your coming on. We will put links to uh, the all the Amazon labor union uh, links that you mentioned and the Congress of Essential Workers. Um, uh, really appreciate the work you're doing, and uh, good luck, and, and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. We'll check in and uh, on that. And uh, sorry you didn't make it to the White House, but um, I hope this was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually a huge fan. I think you did Bob's Burgers. That's my favorite TV show. Oh, oh well, no way. Right. Well, maybe we'll see if we get you paraphernalia. Enjoy the, enjoy, the, enjoy, the, enjoy, the, enjoy the movie. All right, man. Thank you, man. Thank I you for having it. me again. Thanks. All right, have Thanks a good day, guys. Bye-bye. There you go. The uh, Hugo paying off I was one about to say, you got to do the yep. voice. You got to do the voice. Yep. Well, hey, let's see if we can get uh, Benjamin to send over some uh, swag. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, right. Get Benjamin out there on the picket line. <laughs> I mean, doing some voices into a microphone, yeah. I mean, it'd be massive. Yeah. Uh, all right, folks. We're going to take a break and head into the fun half. Listen, just got some feedback about the, um, as you know, we're splitting up the uh, fun half these days from uh, the, um, uh, the first half on YouTube. The link is in the uh, YouTube description. If you're watching on Roku, we now automatically fire the second um, uh, half of the show if you're watching live. Yeah, so we're testing a new uh, feature by YouTube that should send you directly over to the, uh, the fun half. And, and let me make this clear. We're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not quite we, – we're, we're experimenting with things right now. We're trying to figure out, you know, um, the uh, – there's – We've talked in the past about sort of like this advertising situation that we had uh, with uh, our, our, our broker going to dynamic advertising and us not wanting to do that. And so it's inhibited some of the advertising revenue. Um, numbers are down across the board for the most part, unless you're doing anti-vax stuff uh, on YouTube. Um, and we were not. Um, yes. And, you know, this is th there is something there is a, a cyclical nature to these things. But um, and so if you have the, uh, the means to become a member, please do at jointhemajorityreport.com. And we are updating the app and we're going to get, you know, all the sort of the technical pieces together. As you've seen, we've upgraded our video quality and we're playing around with some of that stuff, too. And we're just, you know, we're, we're in the uh, post covid era. Uh, I mean, even though COVID is still here and it is uh, skyrocketing in New York City and around uh, the country, but um, we're, we're trying to just simply uh, adjust some things. So, uh, but again, if you're one of those people who do not have the financial means to get the fun half, and I never want this show to ever be a source of financial stress for anybody, ever. Send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Put the words fun half in the members in the uh, subject line and we will uh, work it out with you. No one will be excluded for money uh, from the second half of the show. Uh, and we have members all the time go through some financial stress. We work it out from them for them. We, we will never lock anybody out of the show for money um so uh send us an email and um although i guess we you know the boston show you gotta pay that's yes it's a live show it's a live show so then that right. instance it's a i mean but I think in the main it. it'd right. be difficult to coordinate the, it would be uh, difficult to coordinate that people have asked about you know what uh what the um what the requirements there there will be a mask requirement uh, my understanding at the um 
at the Wilba. Uh, and also, you, you got to be vaxxed or have had a negative test. I, I understand why. Dystopia. Yeah, it's total dystopia. So I just want to make that clear. Um, you know, and so if you are, um, and, and I'm hoping, frankly, I'm hoping. There's some rumors that there are like, you know, fans of other shows who are going to come and this and that. And I know they're hesitant to get vaccinated, but it'll be worth it for you to come and, and uh, maybe we'll have, I don't know, we'll have a little bit of a debate. Oh, yeah. We'll see. Live. Live. I'm, a, I'm willing to do that. You like that. those libertarian calls? We'll do yeah, it. exactly. Do it live. How awesome would it be to have a 14-hour uh, Wilbur show where the Wilbur <laughs> management is like screaming at Get me? Out. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Just give me one second. This guy's uh, claiming that uh, you know property rights were given by God, and that uh, but God doesn't exist. Tenants are responsible exactly. for the structural yeah, integrity yeah. of their buildings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, also, uh, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority and get ten percent off. And you also get the uh, coffee blend. Yeah, somebody uh, sent. Um, an, an old friend of mine goes, I just got somebody from Wisconsin just sold me, sent me majority report coffee. And uh, just coffee is in, in Wisconsin. Oh, so nice. that was, that was a surprise for them. Um, and also, uh, always don't forget, uh, the discord. If you need anything from the program, uh, resources, whatever it is, uh, the folks in the discord always there to help you out. Matt, what's happening in the, um, Matt uh, Leckian Media Universe. Yeah, really excited for folks to check out the interview with Robin Wansley uh, on Left Reckoning tonight at 8 Central. She is an independent black socialist in Minnesota's Ward 2. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of disappointment in Nina Turner loss, for instance, but there are actually good things happening. And Robin talks about how she uh, decided to run uh, for city council and decided to do it not seeking like some other socialists on, uh, in Minnesota um, as the dual um, endorsement of the Democrats and the DM. Say she ran a uh, purely independent and she won, and now she's able to say, like, call out Jacob Fry in a way that doesn't uh, uh, <laughs> upset her uh, running for re election. So, we talk about her, she's just a, insanely uh, good. She was a fight for 15 and uh, um, teachers union organizer and just a really inspiring person. So, uh, if you haven't checked out Left Reckoning before, I think this is one that we're going to put on, we'd put on like a year end best of list. So, patreon.com slash left reckoning. And you know, when people run in that manner. It's not a, a question of, I don't want to be branded or affiliated this way. It is, I am creating a, an independent power uh, uh, base that at one point, and I'm not speaking for her at all, I'm just talking generically. At one point, it may make sense to, uh, to run as a Democrat with that independent base, or maybe it doesn't. But the point is, that's the reason why you do it. It is not aesthetics. Right. It's not it's because teaching. it doesn't make you feel good or you don't like other people in the party. Yeah, it's not, and it's not theoretical. Like, I mean, Robin uh, is very, she has problems with Democrats. She grew up in Chicago and lived in Minneapolis, so she has problems there. But again, it's like she's working with the DSA members that are, and the progressive Democrats that are going to say, like, support something like, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of uh, reaction against police reform at this moment now, but things like uh, rent control and stuff like that, like you need to work with those people. And then it's also nice to have a little bit of extra independence and build something outside of that. So, yep. uh, yeah, check that out tonight. And the best way to do that is on uh, a local level and build because, if well, some people think the best way to do that is you know, build on a local level. Some people think it's just to decry the pointlessness of electoralism on Twitter. Um, so, <laughs> well, those are two competing, two uh, competing theories. theories. Yeah. All right, folks, heading uh, on uh, to the fun half. We'll be right back after this. 646-257-3920 is the number. Am I forgetting anything? I don't think I am. Nope. All right. See you there. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now. But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. You. Fun. Hack. 
What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No me key. You did it. Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women. Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight. Yes. Is it me? Is it me? It is you. Is it me? Hello, is it me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. <sighs> I'm going to go start off. Who libertarian? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him! So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge map. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857. 210. 35. 501. One half. 38. 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. Five, four, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire, Sam goes to satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, the, the, Look, um, gotta jump. I gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Uh, um, Two o'clock. We're already late. And 